around 2011, and then uh, the Kurds basically declared in 2012 their sort of their autonomy. Um, originally, there were three cantons, uh, Jazeera, Kobani, and then Afrin. Now, as a result of uh, a lot of the territory that's been taken since then, there are seven what they call regions, which are listed right over here. And um, so the, it's really now about one third of, of Syria that is under, um, that is under, uh, I don't know if it's, you could call it rule, but that is being um, brought so organized into, by. organized by the Kurds and their many partners. And, and they very much emphasize the fact that it's a multicultural project, it's not just Kurds, there are Syriacs and there are the Yazidis who live there and there are certainly a large Arab population, but it's very much a project that comes from the Kurdish ideology that was developed by Abdullah Achalan. And are people here familiar with Abdullah Achalan? Yeah. For him. <laughs> so, you know, I won't go into a, a lot about, about that, but in, just in short, as many of you probably know, when he was captured in 1999, he really began a transition away from what we would think of as a sort of typical Marxist-Leninist seizure of state power ideology to this whole new idea of democracy, of grassroots democracy, recognizing very much that the state is really a problem and that seizing state power, as we've seen from the examples of the Soviet Union and, and many other examples, that this nationalist type of project wasn't really gonna be the future for the Kurdish people or really for anybody who cares about uh, true democracy on the grassroots level. And his, his transition started, I mean, in 1999, after he was captured and sentenced to life in prison after his death sentence was commuted, uh, you know, he did a lot of reading, and, and, and that is one of the things that sort of sparked this big change in their approach to Kurdish liberation. But a lot of this also had started much earlier, even in the 80s and 90s, because the women's movement became very strong and very powerful in the Kurdistan uh, Workers' Party, uh, the PKK, and women were already asserting their rights and they were pushing for gender equality. And Echelon was extremely, uh, among many of the men in the party, the person very, very receptive to this and he really made it so that women could become full partners in this liberation project. So these qualities continue very much to animate the whole Kurdish liberation movement of gender equality uh, that picked up since then in the, in the uh, early 2000s, ecology, social ecology, and uh, also grassroots democracy. You could sort of talk about those as the three pillars right now of the Kurdish liberation movement. And what I thought I would do is um, just to talk a little bit about uh, I, first of all, I, I think it would be nice to sh give people an idea of, let's see if we can go to some photos, of some of what is going on there right now, some of what I was able to see when I was just there. I spent three weeks there, uh, just came back a couple of weeks ago, and let's see if we can um, do this. Um, it was, it was <laughs> profoundly interesting to see just how much uh, <coughs> Kurdish society in Rojava differs, for example, from Kurdish society right next door in Iraq. And let me see if we can turn on the, get a kind of a slideshow going here. What I do is take you through a, a few pictures of, um, of what I saw. Um, because one of the things that was really fascinating to me was that, and I hadn't even realized this, was that when I came back from Rojava and I stopped in Iraq in a restaurant on the way back to where I was going to fly home, I realized that I was being spoken to by the men in the restaurant, the, the sort of owners and waiters who were catering to our table, which happened to be a table of women, in a way that was completely different from the way any man had spoken to me in Rojava. It was, 
it was like culture shock. You know, this this guy, these guys came over and they said, so sweetheart, would you like <laughs> some tea now? You know, and I realized that for three weeks, nobody had spoken to me in that in that voice. Nobody had taken that. No man had taken that that sense of liberty. And so one of the things that I want to emphasize is just how powerfully this revolution is a feminist revolution. It's, it's like not even on the table anymore, the question of, oh, do women deserve this or do women deserve that? It's just complete gender equality in every sense. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fact that women are co-chairs of every administrative uh, office, you know, whether it's a mayor of a town or a political office as part of a party, and that they hold 40% of every legislative office, which is also, and, and in reality, they're actually more like 50%. And women are really leading society in every respect. Just everywhere you go, you see it. And I'll, I'll describe that a little bit more. Let's see if we can make this slideshow work. I will go to, uh, is it here, slideshow. So I'm going to. I was the bridge that goes in. Yeah. 